wherever you may hail i'm your host john bruni welcome to the focus where we bring you the most thought-provoking and informative current affairs analysis from around the world each episode we invite top experts and analysts to share their insights on the most pressing issues of our time join us as we explore the complex and ever-changing landscape of the world where we provide valuable perspectives on the events that shape our global community in this episode, we're going to be looking at something that has been doing the rounds for a while now, a meme that was started by famed historian, author and commentator, Professor Neil Ferguson, that we are in Cold War 2.0. To help unpack this meme and what it might entail is returning guest from Germany, U.S. Army Lieutenant General Ben Hodges retired. Ben was commander, NATO Allied Land Command, and is now a seasoned international commentator on defense and security topics. Ben and I are also part of the Dutch-based The Alphen Group, or TAG, led by Professor Julian Lindley French, whose mission is to create solutions for a secure Europe. A link to the TAG website will be in the show notes for those who are interested in the work that we do. But before we start, a shameless plug for ourselves. Please subscribe to our channel. We need the algorithm to find us, and by hitting the subscribe and like buttons, this is your contribution to the growth of what hopefully will become a South Australian global sensation. Ben, welcome back to The Focus. I'm glad to be part of a South Australian sensation. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you for that, Ben. <laughs> anyway, Ben, Neil Ferguson has argued that the rivalry between the United States and China resembles the dynamics of the original Cold War between 1947 to 91. In fact, he says we are currently in what he calls Cold War 2.0. Ben, do you agree with Ferguson's assessment? Are we in a new Cold War? Um, of course, I have great respect for, for Neil, but I uh, don't agree with that as a useful construct. I mean, a lot of people have grabbed onto it because it it is kind of simplistic and it, it provides a framework for thinking about things. But, you know, I was a lieutenant back in the 1980s in West Germany during the Cold War. And uh, what I see now doesn't feel like that. Um, at least in the Cold War, uh, there was... Huge, there were huge forces opposing each other, um, close to each other on either side of the German, uh, East German, West German border. Um, but there was a sort of a structure and there were arms control agreements and there was, you know, it was the Soviet Union. They were the evil empire, but nonetheless, there was kind of a, a structure and the West clearly identified and was unified in recognizing who the threat was. And that's why we had significant military capabilities, air, land, and sea, mm -hmm. nuclear forces, all of that. And it worked for 40 years. I mean, mm -hmm. really from the end of the Second World War until the end of the Soviet Union. What we see now, um, it doesn't have the same structure. And not everybody's agreed that there's a threat um, because of the economic nature of it, uh, more so than the uh, military nature of it. And of course, um, you've got Russia's uh, terrible war uh, in Ukraine, uh, Iran, which is Russia's closest and most reliable ally, working through proxies, um, causing problems in the Red Sea that affect all of us, as well as their support for Hamas, which uh, murdered over a thousand Israelis. Uh, and then you've got North Korea. So it, I don't know saying this is Cold War II, 2.0 is a useful construct for thinking about the challenges and solutions. Ben, why do you think it is that we need to have simple filters through which we see international relations today? Is there something about the fact that we feel very uncomfortable with what we are seeing, which is really something that is a 
almost like a, a devolved state. The inter that international relations is no longer, as you say, structured. It's it's unstructured, and it's becoming less structured as time goes on. You know, uh, today, uh, 19 February, uh, here in Frankfurt, Germany, where I live, 19 February is President's Day back in the U.S., uh, and it really uh, commemorates George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, but it was um, sort of simplified to make it just President's Day to honor all presidents. And um, Abraham Lincoln, the reason he is consistently seen as one of the one, two or three best presidents in our history is because he was able to explain complex things to the American people in a time before podcasts, before television, before <laughs> yeah. radio. You know, you had to be able to talk to people. And um, I think things like uh, Cold War 2.0, those kinds of constructs come up because our leaders are not able to explain to us what's really going on. And so we search for constructs that um, uh, help us try to understand or get our head around what it is we're dealing with. And, you know, if you get one that sounds catchy, but it's the wrong one, I don't, I don't know that it helps us solve anything. So here, you know, my president, uh, prime ministers, Bundeskanzler, other leaders um, have got to communicate to us as if we were adults, but explain, here's the threat. Here's what we're going to do about it. You know, I, I have been thinking about historical uh, parallels myself. Uh, if you go back to 1942, early 1942, Great Britain had suffered disaster after disaster after disaster. I mean, other than stopping the German Luftwaffe uh, in the Battle of Britain, it had been nothing but defeat for almost three years, beginning with Germany's invasion of Poland and then the Soviet invasion of Poland. Um, and then, of course, the United States, we had our own disaster, December 1941, Pearl Harbor. Um, thank goodness Roosevelt didn't tell Churchill, hey, Prime Minister, look, man, there's no way you can win. Uh, you need to negotiate with Hitler because there's no way you, you're going to win for the sake of peace. Let's negotiate. No, these two old guys got together uh, in Washington at a conference called Arcadia in January 1942. Churchill had come to the States, and we have ships in Pearl Harbor that are still smoldering, sailors still trapped inside ships in Pearl Harbor, and they make the strategic decision, Germany first, yeah. that not, not only are we going to actually look to negotiate, we're going, we're going to um, fight all of these threats, but that we're going to prioritize Germany. This was a critical strategic decision, and then one year later at Casablanca, they make the decision, the strategic endgame, unconditional surrender. Now think where we were in the war in 1943. Still disasters everywhere, the Pacific, Africa, Europe. And yet these two leaders had the vision and the courage to say this is worth defending. And then they explained it. They explained it to the populations and they converted industry to what was necessary to win. So that that's why... I mean, that's the kind of thing that we need now is clarity of vision, clarity of strategic objective, and then mobilize industries and populations. But as a former senior military officer, and and having gone from, as you say, the Cold War into, you know, the unipolar moment and the various changes that took place, both at the political and the military level, and now seeing where we are, you know, you've got that expanse of history behind you. What went so fundamentally wrong? You've just talked about where we went so right in spite of all the disasters of World War II. And yet, you know, in a, and I don't want to dismiss the, uh, the historic impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but in the scheme of trying to measure that up against the horror of World War II, it's still a very small war. Why is it that our politicians have no capacity to think about what is right and what is wrong, what is worth fighting for and what isn't. I mean, what, where, where does this mess all lead us? I mean, we, we seem to be completely lost and devoid of that um, vision, as you say, um, in terms of international relations and statecraft. 
I think we've gotten, uh, well, we've certainly we've been spoiled for the last few decades. Um, we were we were not prepared psychologically for winning the Cold War, that the Soviet mm -hmm. Union would collapse. I don't think you could find too many people in 1988 who predicted that in 1989, the Soviet Union would collapse. Uh, and so we were unprepared. And then it was like, wow, this is great. It's the uh, peace dividend. We don't need all this stuff anymore. Um, everything's just going to be great. And and so we lost our uh, strategic um, focus and understanding of the reality of the world. Um, and, and there was, I think, too much hubris. And I certainly, I would have been guilty of it. I mean, in the, at the end of the Cold War, it's like, wow, we won. Germany reunited and, you know, it's, it's just going to be great now. And uh, that was that was naive. And uh, and then there there are um, people who we're we're so easily deterred now. We we are self deterring because of people are concerned that oh Russia might use a nuclear weapon. Not I, I think there's almost zero percent chance that Russia will use a nuclear weapon. Um, but because we think they might, we stop making decisive, uh, taking decisive steps that would not only help Ukraine, for example, but send a strong signal to Iran, send a strong signal to China. We're reluctant to use our uh, the combined power in economies and militaries and diplomatic strength of our allies and partners. So getting organized is is what is called for. So my my Arcadia conference and Casablanca conference. That's that's tr I'm trying to get my own head around how do we organize? You need some organizing principles about strategic end state uh, command structures. Uh, and, and where you mobilize the industrial capacity and the diplomatic power of like-minded states, such as those in NATO and our allies in the Indo-Pacific region. If we combine our, our efforts, it dwarfs whatever China could do or Russia could do or whatever. But the fact that we are not fully unified and willing to act uh, allows those uh, adversaries and potential adversaries to um, attack the seams in our relationships. As a military man, do you think that we gave economists too much of a sway in public policy? I mean, you know, there was a time where if you were an economist, you could basically say whatever crazy thing came into your head and be taken seriously. If you happen to be in the military and you were saying, well, hang on a tick, I don't think that the world is like that. It might be a little bit more fraught than what you're giving credit for. You'd be hounded out of the room. So do you think that there was a sort of ideology very much um, in the sort of 1990s, early 2000s, which really diminished um, the capacity for military people to influence political leaders because everyone thought that greed was good and somehow greed and the love of money and wealth would unite people irrespective of what their political position happens to be, whether they're an autocracy or a democracy? Um, that, that's, that's an interesting question. You know, I I certainly can't claim to fully understand all the different economic factors and indicators uh, we missed all that towards the end of the Cold War. We didn't realize how weak things were inside the Soviet Union. Um, and, and of course, now we are all awash in statistics and people making estimates about what's going on. And I mean, if you don't deal in financial markets or uh, economic stuff all the time, it's candidly for me, it's very difficult to know, OK, what is the significance of this? Uh, I just came back from Munich yesterday and I was there for the Munich Security Conference. And, you know, you hear people say, oh, my God, Russia's on a war footing. Their economy is 7% of their GDP is focused on defense, on military. And that that sounds, wow, oh, my gosh. But then I remember two years ago when my German friends were saying, come on, Ben, there's no way Russia's going to attack Ukraine. Their economy is the size of Italy. Hmm. So if that's true, then 7% GDP of uh, GDP of Italy all of a sudden doesn't sound a whole lot, like a whole lot, yep. or 7% of Spain. <clears throat> but that's how these numbers get tossed around. And 
uh, and I think we tend to overreact. Um, and, and I've had so many people say that Russia, you, there's no way you can defeat Russia. Their, their economy is, is too big. They have endless amounts of this and that. But actually, um, sanctions are having some effect. Um, they're having to sell gas to China at way below what they used to get for that gas. And Europe's not um, buying almost no, very little gas from Russia anymore. So there is economic power um, that is important for trying to hold these uh, authoritarian states accountable. Um, I, I, I don't think I'm answering your question very clearly because it is, it's not, it's almost like you're asking me to say, you know, the economists had too much influence on what nations did and they should have listened to the military. I think, you know, <laughs> we haven't exactly been perfect in our recommendations either. Yeah. Um, ben, the, uh, you know, the idea of a Cold War, if we looked at the original Cold War as our template, it was all about ideology. On the one side, you had the United States leading the capitalist powers. On the other side, you had uh, the Russian or the Soviets leading the communist powers. It was very clear uh, those divisions were easy to understand the dividing lines, where to cross, what not to do. It was all codified. It was order in the world. I mean, it may not have been a great order on the other side of the Iron Curtain, but there was order nonetheless. But what we're seeing now, I don't know. I mean, I suppose that if we go back to the Cold War 2.0 thing, Neil Ferguson does say that it's uh, it's you know very very much an ideological struggle that we're seeing at the moment. You know, we've got China leading the bloc of autocracies and the United States leading the free West, but I don't think it's quite that clear. Um, you know, there was a time when one could look at the United States and be very sure where that stood in the world. But considering mm. the internal turmoil in the United States, we really don't have an idea what the United States actually stands for. I mean, I know what it wants to stand for, but you know, come November, things might change. And we might be in a very, we might be having a very different conversation, or no conversation at all, for that matter. Yeah, this is extremely uh, frustrating as well as embarrassing for me to to have to hear what you just said and, and to know that it's um, true to to a great extent. Um, even though <clears throat> nations, people have criticized U.S. policy over the decades, you know, whether it's Vietnam or going into Iraq or or different other policies of ours, um, most people felt confident that our institutions were strong enough to keep us from going completely off the rail, that you just, okay, we're going to deal with this guy as president for four years, but hopefully there'll be a different president or or whatever, or the Congress will change. Um, and that is, to me, that's normal in democratic societies. You know, you won't always like the policy, and that's why you, you work harder for, for the next election, get your guy in there, or your woman. Um, now, uh, for the first time in my life, I'm looking at the Republican Party, the party of Reagan, backing down from supporting Ukraine against Russia. I mean, it's unbelievable to me <clears throat> that um, a uh, Trump and his enablers that include a few senators that used to be uh, seen as defense hawks are now we're stopping aid for Ukraine and Russia benefits from this. It, it's absolutely incredible. And so, of course, now our allies, uh, particularly in Europe, but not only, are scratching their head like, what are we going to, what in the hell is going on here? Um, and of course, this only emboldens Putin if he sees that, you know, the U.S. might not be fully committed uh, or unwilling to do what needs to be done you know, because they don't care about their own casualties, they don't care about civilian uh, casualties, they don't care about violations of international law, witness the demise of Mr. Navalny two two days ago. Uh, the uh, risk for continued or expanded fighting only goes up. Um, the Chinese, of course, are watching all this, that where if they see that we are not able and willing to uh, come together and stop Russia, to defeat them, not not push Ukraine to negotiate for a peace settlement that will never, ever last, uh, that Russia will never uh, live up to, 
uh, the Chinese must be thinking, well, they won't be very impressed with anything that we say about Taiwan or the South China Sea. So these things like freedom of navigation, uh, respect for sovereignty, respect for human rights, respect for international agreements, uh, it'll be much more difficult for us to enforce those at way out in the Pacific than it is for on the contiguous European landmass. So uh, I think uh, our inability and unwillingness to address the threats decisively only makes things uh, worse for us. I don't know what's going to happen in November. Um, that's that's nine months away. Uh, a lot can happen in uh, American politics in nine months. Um, frankly, I don't think Mr. Trump, I, I would not bet money that he will be elected. Uh, he's got a lot of problems between now and then. What's more concerning to me is not him, but there are millions of Americans that support him and would vote for him, even if he was in an orange jumpsuit. That That is, is more concerning to me. I think uh, another thing of great concern is, in spite of the so-called Sino-American global struggle, however you want to describe that, um, we've got this subtext, which is actually quite dangerous. People are talking about it and they're, they're expressing a lot of fear about this, uh, this, this aspect of what we're seeing today, and that is the rise of AI and, uh, you know, surveillance technologies. Now, the problem uh, that I see is that the Biden administration has taken one very firm stab at all of this by putting forward the CHIP Act, which is designed to prevent the Chinese from getting access to, you know, Western derived high end semiconductors, which I think is probably Biden's number one foreign policy deal. But from your perspective, do you think that this has been enough of a uh, a clipping of the of, of the CCP's wings in terms of their technological aspirations, or do they still have enough of the good stuff within mainland China to make things work? Maybe develop parallel technologies. They might not be as good as what we can come up with in the West, but they'll be good enough to um, do some damage to us long term. Yeah, I, I would expect that they are are working twenty four seven there in China to create um, using stolen technologies or to mm -hmm. copy uh, uh, what you saw, uh, reverse engineer what they've gotten from us and to make their own. So I I would not assume that that's no longer a, a problem. So I, I'm glad that the president did what he did. But, you know, uh, multiple administrations and Congresses, Democrat and Republican, as well as pretty much all the rest of the free world, uh, we we were so happy to get cheaper products from China that we completely um, dropped our, lowered our guard about who was coming into all the universities, where all this technology was going, because people saw they could make so much money um, or that prices would be lower if you buy something made in China. And, and so we are now, um, having to figure out, um, you know, Dr. Funderline, the president of the European Commission came up with the phrase, you know, uh, de-risk, not decouple, which I think is more than just a catchy phrase because all of us would like to continue to be able to do business with a gigantic market like China and other countries in the region. Um, but that doesn't mean that uh, we should accept all the risks that comes with wide open markets, but instead use uh, the international organizations, organizations and agencies to make sure that China complies with international agreements. That would require all of us acting together and not every nation is willing to, to do the hard work necessary to, to do that. Yeah, interesting. I mean, I look at it from a, a little bit of a different perspective. Being in Australia and having our country go through absolute conniptions over its relationship with China there's no real easy way of saying it. You're either with them or you're really against them. Um, I, I know that the words that are being used at the moment at senior levels in politics suggests that we can have our cake and eat it too. If only the Chinese could be, would comply to our standards and our protective measures. 
But of course, they're always going to be seeking advantage. And you said yourself, they're going to be, you know, uh, stealing anything that isn't nailed down. They're going to be using influence operations. They're going to be using ways in which they can um, corrupt local politicians in order for them to get ahead. There's a level of hard, hard calculus in the CCP with regard to their relations with the West that we simply don't seem to have. I mean, we're starting to understand that we need to do more. But the the simple fact is, and from a strategic perspective, you, you you've got to you've got to agree with me, Ben. <laughs> if you trade with your so-called enemy, you are enabling their wealth, you're enabling their technological prowess, and you're enabling their military expansion. Again, this doesn't seem to me like a cold war because you can't have you, you know the the other side which we're fighting, the so-called autocratic BRICS, China-led block, if you want to put it that way, they're, they've, they've bled into our systems in, in such a, an intimate fashion. Trying to pull them back out uh, is going to do enormous damage to ourselves. So have we not actually created our own, dare I say, threat? I mean, we built China. It was Western investment that built China once the Chinese economy opened up in 1978. So we have responsibility to own up to in terms of where China is today. And so treating it like an enemy and then treating it like a trading partner to me makes absolutely no sense. It's either one thing or it's something else. And if it's something else, then we have to treat it as such, right? Well, <clears throat> I'm not prepared to say we should not do any trade or anything with China because um, I mean, it. They China sits on top of a lot of things that we all need, certain rare earth materials, for example. Um, but I think if we can step back a little bit and look more strategically at the situation, um, China, I think, is in very, very precarious situation now economically. And again, I. You've got listeners that will know much more about this than I do. And I admitted earlier in the in our conversation that I'm not an economist, but I mean, I read and pay attention to enough stuff to know that <clears throat> their system is in deep trouble. Uh, and of course, their demographics uh, are they're in deep trouble population wise. So yep. down the road, you know, that that's going to have a have an impact. So um are are we doing things? Are we are we anticipating what might happen in the next five, 10, 20 years in China uh, that would have an impact? Or can we shape that uh, in such a way that the relationships, the trust, uh, the connections become something that's uh, not a threat? Uh, I'm not a lawyer either, by the way. I was a very simple infantry soldier for 38 years. But I do know that international law is whatever the international community says it is, what gets enforced. Mm -hmm. So freedom of navigation, for example, there's no there's no police out there making sure that ships are able to move. It requires the U.S. Navy, uh, the Royal Navy, the Royal Australian Navy to be able to enforce it, to make keep sea lanes open. I think that's what we have to do. We have to focus on the... Uh, um, the so-called rules-based international order, which sounds like some political science uh, professors gobbledygook, but it really is freedom of navigation. Yeah. It really is uh, respect for sovereignty. It really is respect for international law. We have to enforce that. And, and uh, that requires military capability, but it also requires um, our diplomats working together in the various institutions. And now China has been clever to build up uh, advocates throughout Africa and the Middle East so that they get more support in the United Nations, for example, than they otherwise would have, which enables them to, to do certain things. This is what I meant earlier about the West has to be organized, where we bring together the combined political will, industrial capacity, and military capability to enforce and protect this international rules-based order, which the Chinese hate and the Russians hate. Yeah, 
Yeah, certainly. I'm John Bruni, and you're listening to Sage International's The Focus podcast. And from Germany, we're speaking with U.S. Army Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, retired, on Professor Neil Ferguson's idea that we are in Cold War 2.0. Ben, internationally, you know, things have fundamentally changed since 1991. You know, what are the potential consequences for nations caught in the middle of the Sino-American rivalry, you know, particularly in regions like Southeast Asia, Africa and Latin America? I mean, unlike during the Cold War, where those non-aligned countries and the so-called non-aligned movement were extremely poor, underdeveloped post-colonial states, today those countries have matured into resource-rich global extractive industrial centers. While the riches from these extractive industries have only been very narrowly applied, meaning that the bulk of their populations are still very poor, the political and economic leaderships are extremely wealthy and influential. There is a sense among these national elites that they can safely play American, European and Chinese interests off each other. Has this indeed given these countries some strategic advantage and greater, greater freedom of movement? And does this bode for greater levels of international instability? You know, as you were talking, I was started thinking about Vietnam and uh, the Philippines, countries like this that are that are in that sort of uh, they're not caught, but are in that scene. And, and I think uh, the fact that they are they might not be confident that the U.S. and uh, Australia and uh, U.K. Uh, will always be there will be able to that they can count on us. Um, I, I think that that hurts us um, if we want to compete. Uh, and, and I don't mean in a colonial sense, but in a democratic, transparent, um, our system of uh, good trade agreements, fair trade agreements, uh, reliability, um, that they have to believe in that so that they are willing to take the risk of pushing back against what China is trying to do, and most—I mean, these guys are not stupid. They—they they can see that if you if you make a deal with China, Chinese come in, make a gigantic, build your port for you, or, or build infrastructure, um, you you are trapped. But if you desperately need a seaport or railroad or bridges, um, and and nobody else offers, you're you're going to take it. Yeah. And, and so, uh, this is where. Uh, we have to be willing to compete. That also means, though, that my my president has to explain to the American people why it's to our advantage that we are investing in infrastructure, or we we have uh, we've done things to enable American companies to invest in infrastructure in Vietnam. Why does that help the U.S. And uh, you know, go back to our earlier comment uh, discussions about uh, communicating with our public. That's that's a hard sell. I it mean, is. That's that's the problem we're having right now with uh, Republicans. When you say, "Why do we care about Ukraine's border? What about our border?" And that's mm. that's way way overly simplistic. But it, it's easy for the opposition to use that as a as a cudgel. And and so we've got again, it comes down to our leaders being able to explain what our priorities are and and why it's to our benefit. And be able to say that so that people in Missouri, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Texas, uh, Idaho understand and accept it. That's that's a, that's a tall order. Strategic communication at that level. I mean, you either have it or you don't. And I think it's uh, it's not something that can be easily taught. I think there are certain individuals who come to us that have that innate skill to be able to bring it all together. And unfortunately, we just don't have those th those people thick on the ground. I was going to say, while I was listening to you uh, 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 talk about this, um, you know, in terms of competing with the Chinese, or at least allowing Western interests to be competitive in a place like Africa, that in itself is going to be very important in terms of even the overarching national security requirements of a place like Europe. I mean, uh, the South of Europe in particular is, uh, you know, I mean, they don't share the notion of the of their northern compatriots or their eastern compatriots where 
the Russians are the clear and present threat. They look at the migrants coming across the Mediterranean from Africa as the clear and impending threat. So there's a sort of security division between the South, the North and the East in terms of how security is confabulated. But if you're talking about the Europeans in particular going back into Africa, you're going to have all sorts of people raising the old colonial issues, even if the Europeans try to use clever language to, to deflect from that. Um, and even though the Chinese, who are currently using old colonial methods, are doing it, and no one seems to really make a big deal of it. I mean, I know from my experiences uh, in Ethiopia, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, if no one's prepared to give the Ethiopians... Uh, you know, the, the material necessary to build a road or railroad or tram lines down Addis Ababa, they will go to the Chinese. The Chinese will say, look, we can do this for you. And that's fine. But with that comes a bunch of other stuff, which for local people, well, they find it rather intrusive. You know, you've got the Chinese engineers, then you've got the Chinese workmen. And these people don't necessarily play nice with the locals and the locals don't like their presence either. I know that there is a a wedge through which Europe and North America can try to exploit this, but because of their own respective histories, I think trying to get traction in a place like Africa, maybe for the United States and Latin America, it's going to be very, very difficult. What What are your thoughts? So uh, two things come to mind. Um, it's uh, values versus uh, interests mm. is one thing. Uh, the second thing is uh, objective, uh, strategic objective. What what are you trying to accomplish? What what do we want the the strategic situation to be? Whether it's in different parts of Africa or uh, different parts of Asia or Europe or whatever. And and so you know if you don't if you if you can't lay out a strategic objective then you cannot possibly come up with a successful strategy to get there if you don't know where you're what you're trying to get to and you can't marshal the resources and you can't articulate it through your legislative uh, bodies. So being able to, and it's got to be tangible enough. It can't be something like, well, we want peace in the world and everybody to, you know, live free and prosper. Um, it's it's got to be tangible um, objectives and then you have to balance our values with with those strategic interests. And I think we have hurt ourselves sometimes by over. And it, this is not going to sound very sound very good, but I, I'm going to say it anyway. And you can push back on me. We have overemphasized values sometimes at uh, to the cost of achieving uh, or protecting our strategic interests. In other words, it, it, the strategic interests may require us to work with uh, nations or, or heads of state that are not exactly um, Jeffersonian Democrats. There's no way we can, we can achieve any sort of lasting, uh, reasonably uh, normalized relationships in the Middle East without working with Saudi Arabia. Okay, well, MBS, you know, everybody's pretty confident that he had something to do with the death of Khashoggi and plenty mm -hmm. of other, I mean, Saudi Arabia is not a democratic society, but yet that's who we have to work with. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think um, the idea of being able to work, make sure our interests are protected and then find ways to uh, continue to um, protect, uh, promote our values. But that also requires us to live up to our own talking points inside democratic countries. We, we're, not, we're not living up to our own talking points. And so that undermines our ability to promote our values abroad. I'm going to bring something up, which is directly related to what you're saying, although probably our audience will think, what the hell is he talking about? So just be patient with me. Look, I'm, over the last- I'm still trying to understand what you used the word confabulated earlier. I'm, so... Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, ma manufactured in a fantastical way. <laughs> I'm sorry, I lapse into Australianisms ever so often. If, if, I, if I go a little bit too far, Ben, pull me back. 
Okay. Anyway, uh, Ben, I was going to say that, um, you know, having been a lecturer uh, at a local university here, the uh, University of Adelaide for a number of years, you know, I've, and being in that sort of international relations framework, I mean, I understand that many of the senior academics like to play with theories that are very highly idealistic in terms of the way the world is seen. You know, you've got many scholars who have written tomes about, you know, ideological ways in which we can come to a nice, peaceful kumbaya settlement with our enemies. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're grounded in any sort of fact in our universe, but it's stuff that they've managed to put out there in, in the firmament. And of course, you know, when many academics start repeating these fantastical stories to young, impressionable minds, you will start getting people coming out of the university system filled with all these notions of what might be possible because some academic has said something in 1963, which they found interesting during a lecture. Um, and when you get a critical mass of these type of people, these young idealists going into the US State Department, or they go into the Foreign Office in the UK, or they come into the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia, you'll find that you know, the the outcomes and the notions of foreign relations becomes very, very much mired in this, I don't want to say woke, it's not really woke, but high idealism, kind of like when you're talking about paranormal activity, you talk about things like high strangeness. I think that when you talk about foreign policy in the West today, most of our um, foreign policy institutions are not corrupted, but they're penetrated by this high idealism which never seems to work and and it doesn't matter how many times we butt our heads against the hard truth of a vladimir putin a saddam hussein or the fact that we have to sit down with mbs and have tea and make nice these people get all bent out of shape you know there's no sense of well you know there is a there is the reality that's there that we have to deal with and then there's my personal view which may be slightly removed from the reality of the situation. How much do you think that our education system, especially at the university level, has let a lot of students down because we didn't focus on more realism and we focused too much on the ideolo uh, ideological stuff? Well, uh, I... Uh... I do think that our university system, at least in the United States, we lost our way in some places because you had administrators um, who were unwilling to enforce some kind of discipline that in the interest of free speech, they would allow the most outrageous things to be said. Mm. Uh, but then if, if you had, say, a speaker that was uh, more conservative, for example, that came in he would be shouted down by students and, and administrators would would not discipline that because they were they were scared. Yeah, frankly, in yeah. Many cases. So so part of this is uh, is mature, disciplined people uh, in our in our education systems. Now, maybe I'm not a good person to comment on this because I went to the military academy at West Point. <laughs> so I did not have the uh, the typical uh university experience but i tell you what i do remember vividly from the seventh grade uh my teacher mrs mckendry social social science teacher uh now so i'm 65 years old so obviously this was before the internet before iphones before all these other ways that people get their information she said ben you have got to have more than one source of information you can't read just one you know, magazine. And back then it was like U.S. News, World Report, Time, you know, the, those were the big uh, magazines. And then you had the local newspaper and all that. And I think we had three channels, ABC, CBS, and NBC. She said, you have to have more than one source of information. And so my education included admonitions from teachers to challenge, to be critical in your thinking, to question something, not just uh, absorb it. And so um, I think that's just as true today. And yes, of course, I mean, it, it. it's not new that students go to universities and come out 
maybe more idealistic than they will be 10 years down the road after they've had some life experience. But that's the that's not a terrible thing. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that people might start off in an idealistic way and you would like to keep that. But um, I, again, this is where our leaders, and I keep going back to leadership, positive leaders that speak to populations as if they were adults and say, look, here's here's what's important. You elected me. Here's what's important. Here's what, here's what we're going to have to do. And actually, most people if you explain things to them and talk in a way that they trust that you're not, they're not being spun. Yeah. Um, then most people still, even today are generally reasonable, but if they think they're being lied to or, or spun, then they won't trust it. See, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, not only from the academic teaching side of things, but also from media engagement. I mean, I, I know I, I used to run into a lot of people in the media who really treated the audience like a bunch of, uh, here I'm going to lapse into an Australianism, a bunch of mugs, you know, that they didn't know anything, spoon feed them as much BS as possible and get them off, you know. But, uh, you know, when I went to, when I went into the studio, when I had to sort of uh, in, engage, especially at to- a talkback, which is very challenging in the middle of the night at the height of the war on terror and public panic about almost everything. Um, it was for me, it was an extension of my teaching. And I really enjoyed engaging with people. And when you give people the respect that they're due, they will also give it back to you in spades. So I absolutely agree with you. I think that the idea of being able to treat people as adults and not rob them of their adulthood because you somehow think that you're better than them or that they have no right to know X, Y, or Z is probably the the greatest insult that you can actually pay to people, right? But anyway, getting back to, <laughs> I'll have to pull it back to where we were. And, you know, we're talking about, uh, for our audience, because this, this this conversation has been great, but now we're going to pull it all back. We're talking about the idea of Cold War 2.0. Professor Neil Ferguson says that we are in it. Ben and I believe that we're seeing something quite different. I would even go so far as to say it's very difficult to find the right historic analogy for what we are seeing today. I mean, we can take the idea of the Sino-American struggle and then put that within that the old Cold War American struggle, but there is really no comparison because, you know, the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, you know, from an economics perspective alone, and I know that, you know, we spoke, we touched on economics before, but this is really basic economics 101 in terms of they were autarkic. They were not plugged into the international community as the Chinese are today. So as we mentioned earlier, the Chinese themselves aren't necessarily a threat like the Soviet Union used to be. And the Americans, well, you know, they're finding it difficult to understand where they are in this new world as well. So when we're talking about Cold War and and the environment of a Cold War, and going back to what you were saying earlier, Ben, which I, I agree with you 100%, it's very much based on order um, and the imposition of order on one side and on the other. And this is something that we are not really seeing. Even when we talk about the so-called China-Russia-led BRICS movement, there are more things dividing those members than uniting them. You know, the the Warsaw Pact, however, was joined to the hip to the Soviet Union in a way that the BRICS states are not. They are semi-autonomous, doing their own thing, cooperating where they must and disagreeing where they often do. So it's a, a totally different kind of situation. Um, I would even go, I would go so far as to say it is a historic. The time that we're going through is a historic. We have never been in this time before. What do you think? I'm, I'm always reluctant to say this is un- something's unprecedented. It's never happened. It's the biggest ever, longest, fast, you know, whatever. I don't know that those are useful uh, in, to the conversation and to, and to understanding. Um, I do believe that we are grasping for ways to understand what's happening around us. Mm. You know, we, we've got, <laughs> in some ways, we've got more information and less understanding. Yep. Because there's so much information coming in. I mean, 
uh, all of us are, you, uh, you run a great podcast, you lecture, you uh, write, uh, we're all competing in the information space uh, mm -hmm. to try and help influence how people think about things. And so we're all awash. I, I bet I look at minimum, minimum 70 different news sources every day, whether it's articles that come to me in a variety of different formulations or people share things or uh, I read the Financial Times and New York Times every day. I'm still old, old enough that I like having paper in my hand. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to understand and organize our, our thinking. And uh, um, we don't even know what to call this war in Ukraine. Russia's war against Ukraine, the Russo-Ukrainian war, the Black Sea war. I mean, someday historians will come up. They'll be able to label it. But right now we don't we don't know what to call it and or when it actually started. When I hear, well, the second anniversary of the war. No, it started 10 years ago when they invaded Ukraine. And then someone could say, well, actually, this is a part of the Black Sea War and Russia invaded Georgia in 2008. And so trying to organize our thinking there. What's important for me is uh, have we identified what our strategic objectives are? What are we trying to get to? The way Churchill and Roosevelt did. The more I think about it, the more impressed I am that they, even while three years of disasters, the U.S. Navy is at the bottom of Pearl Harbor, and, Church, and Roosevelt says we have to defeat Germany first because uh, Great Britain might not survive. And then we'll never be able to get back into Europe. So the strategic thinking uh, uh, without any certainty about what was going to happen over the next few years, that was incredible. And, uh, and then to make the decision uh, in early 1943 at Casablanca Conference, unconditional surrender. Now, th these are men who, uh, in some cases, had fought in the First World War and saw that absence of unconditional surrender only guaranteed that World War II. So they were determined to, to fight for And this is in early 1943. So there was, you know, not a lot of, of good news out there, but yet they had already made decisions because they recognized the potential, the economic potential, uh, and it, they were confident that they could get their populations on board, that this was about democracy, uh, free societies against authoritarian fascist uh, dictators. That very clear. And, and you, you made that point earlier. Uh, the, the other thing that's very difficult to explain is the concept of deterrence. Uh, I mean, no, no parliamentarian. Correct no congressman wants to spend a lot of money on something that they hope they'll never use. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, why should we buy this ammunition? We're probably never going to have to use it. We could use that money elsewhere and, and look where we are. And, and I think uh, we, we know from at least 5,000 years of human history that uh, the best way to prevent a war is to make it very, very clear that you're prepared for it. Yeah. And uh, we have to keep relearning that. Yeah, we do. It's almost like a, a weird form of amnesia that we go through periodically. Now, now tell me, uh, Ben, you were at the Munich Security Conference. Was there any hopeful sign that you saw at the conference that there is a form of strategic thinking coming to the fore? So, um, yes and no. Uh, yes, I saw and heard a lot of um, very good uh, speakers, heads of state, heads of government, defense uh, experts, et cetera, um, showing real resolve. And of course, at the front of the at the front of this were our allies from Eastern Europe. Uh, yeah. Yep. You know, from Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Finland, Poland. I mean, really. Uh, the resolve that they have, Romania. Hmm. Uh, but also you're starting to hear from some Germans a much stronger sense of uh, we have to do so. We can't just sit back. We have to do something. So uh, clarity about who the bad guy is here <clears throat> better than in the past where people would say, oh, you know, it's our fault. We we provoked Russia. That Didn't hear any of that. None okay. of that nonsense. Uh, but what I did also see, at least while there's a lot of people passionate about this, you don't get the sense of urgency in terms of action. Hmm. I mean, 
um, I learned something startling. Uh, we were I was in a meeting where we're talking about ammunition production and a guy who comes from the European uh, Commission, who's part of one of the organizations responsible for how do we get to a million ammunition artillery rounds to send to Ukraine. There's a lot of ammunition already being produced by European companies. 70% of it goes elsewhere, like to UAE or uh, to African customers. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not like we have to build new factories. Although that is uh, that will help, it's reprioritizing if we're serious about it. And, and unfortunately, what it's not happening fast enough. It'll eventually get there, but it's going to come about a year or two uh, later than it should have, which means thousands of Ukrainian soldiers and innocent people are going to die. Oh, okay. Well. Uh... Following on from that, Ben, and probably drilling down a little bit more into what you've just said, how do you see European defence expenditure and the state of European defence production in coming months and years ahead? We saw that Germany has recently increased its defence budget, but will this be a permanent thing or a once-off? Furthermore, Britain is currently stretched by supporting Ukraine, participating in NATO exercises, assisting the U.S. Navy in operations in the Red Sea against the Houthis, and planning a global presence through, or uh, through the AUKUS Security Compact. How realistic is it that Britain undertakes these simultaneous roles when it simply doesn't have the money necessary to follow through on these plans? I mean, added to this is the fact that the U.K. was recently declared in a state of recession. This will put even more strain on London's ability to hit key national security targets, right? Yeah. So as our friend, uh, Professor Julian Lindy French always says, uh, do you have the defense that you need or do you have the defense that you can afford? Right. Um, clearly, if you want to enjoy all the benefits of a liberal democratic society, you have to be secure. And that's that's got to be the first priority. That doesn't mean you have uh, unlimited spending on defense. Uh, you have to, we have to be clever and smart about it. <clears throat> and defense is about more than just ships and planes and drones. It's also about strong, resilient societies and resilient infrastructure and the ability to mobilize um, when necessary. Um, I think clearly UK has has enormous responsibilities but wholly inadequate in terms of the size of its capabilities. Um, the, the British Army today, still the same quality of people and, and sergeants and officers, but it's it's smaller than uh, Wellington's army that showed yeah. up um, yeah. at Waterloo. I mean, yeah. they're stretched around the world. And uh, it's not, this, these are choices. Uh, in Germany, you're right. They have, uh, I mean, the language is changing. I, I heard the uh, <clears throat> the defense minister the other day. I heard the German defense minister talk use the word Kriegstutisch, which means prepared for war. But two right. years ago, he would have been run out of town. But now, <laughs> like, yes, that's exactly right. We have to prepare our. We have to be ready uh, to return to the culture of readiness. To be prepared to fight tonight, which is was the culture for 40 years of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. um, so he's he speaks clearly, and he's the most popular politician in Germany. He has higher rating than talk about Mr. Pistorius, and he speaks very clearly about what's needed. Now the Germans have a huge debate. Um, do they do they pay for this? And this that to answer your question, do they pay for all of this on a sort of special Zondervermögen, which is a special fund? Or does this become part of the normal budget? Because you know the Germans do have this culture also of no deficit spending and and so on. So they've got so their their debate now. This is a good thing. Their debate is how, not if, they should increase spending. Uh, the NATO summit, which will celebrate the 75th anniversary of NATO this uh, July in Washington D.C., um, they're going to announce that 20 countries. 19 or 20, I think it's 20, assuming Sweden, uh, Hungary finally drops their opposition, Sweden is admitted, you'll have 20 out of 32 countries are at or beyond that 2% that we all agreed to meet. That, that's remarkable. It should be 32, obviously. But yeah. uh, the fact is, uh, even though 2% is not the best metric, that's the one that everybody agreed. And uh, well over half, almost two thirds of the alliance 
will be added. That's it. That's incredible. That is a significant improvement. Um, but still, um, our leaders are going to have to help make the case why uh, we need to produce ammunition, why we need to we need to uh, fix our procurement processes so we get the right stuff faster. Um, and are we, what are we learning from all the conflicts around us? Do we have the right capabilities that we need um, to be able to uh, protect our populations? We absolutely do not have enough air and missile defense. If you look at what the Russians have done against Ukrainian civilian targets, we are unprepared. On mm -hmm. the other hand, uh, when I look at Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, these three countries, three small countries, if they went to total full mobilization with all the people that they have gone, that they have trained already on top of what they have, you're talking about half a million, half a million women and men that could be in uniform if you combine the three. Now, that's that's a simplified way of looking at it. But the fact is, these three countries, they're not confused about the threat or, or what's required. While I was listening to you, I was thinking of my own country and our problems with defense. You know, we uh, we have a government that came in only recently on the ticket that they were going to be doing a whole bunch of things. Um, I suppose everything now revolves around this whole AUKUS security pact. But when you look at the Australian Army, Air Force, Navy, they are small. They are old in terms of equipment. Um, and, you know, the Navy in particular, for many years, Australia was a land power. I know it sounds a bit weird for our audience, but, you know, we had always been supporting Great Britain and then the United States with our land forces, uh, even though we're an island continent and should have been uh, considering ourselves a major maritime power in this region. It's only been recently that people started thinking, well, it's about time that we grow the Navy, which was a great idea until we stopped growing the Navy and we let our recruitment and ret retention levels drop to crisis point where we are having to now mothball major warships. You know, at at the same time, we've got these, these extraordinarily highbrow ambitions of being able to, you know, purchase, build, Virginia-class submarines here in Australia at major, major cost to the local economy, which is now starting to struggle. Um, and we've got a, uh, I think we've got a, a major surface fleet review coming out within, I think it'll be either this week or next week. And I don't know whether or not it's going to have any good news for the surface fleet because, you know, we're caught in a situation where we either have large warships that can sit along British large warships and American large warships, or a fleet of smaller warships, which are going to be easier to man and maintain moving forward. We have some major problems over here, and yet we're part of the Western system, and we're losing the plot, shall we say. <laughs> so um, I think that the... Uh... What we're learning from how the uh, Ukrainians have wrecked the Russian Black Sea Fleet is causing everybody to, to, to rethink what do you need in terms of maritime capabilities to protect uh, freedom of navigation, to protect our interests, to protect your shores, your ports, uh, to protect shipping. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got the Houthis, which are not a state, but obviously they're well they'll they're well uh resourced by Iran are able to disrupt shipping in the in the uh, Red Sea, which affects all of us with the use of long range anti ship missiles. Mm -hmm. um, allies uh, have pretty much we've reached the capability now where the Russians cannot even use the Baltic Sea if we decided to because you've got uh, with the addition of Finland and soon Sweden mm -hmm. and the capabilities that uh, you have, you don't have to have big ships up in the Baltic Sea. Now, obviously, the Pacific is a different uh, strategic and geographic situation because of the huge distances. You need aircraft carriers. You need mm -hmm. long-range uh, submarines. You need surface warfare capability. But we're not going to invade China. So thinking through what what is it that you need to protect freedom of navigation and protect our interests 
what does that look like? And I think we're going to see increasing numbers of maritime unmanned systems. The yep. U.S. recently conducted a test where they had a, uh, a Navy drone move, went all the way across the Atlantic. Um, now, you know, the, eventually these things will be big enough to have a payload to be able to do, whether it's an, countermine, anti-submarine, uh, anti-ship, or just reconnaissance, uh, or cargo. So, the, you know, these are the kind of capabilities. These are much less expensive than capital ships that require enormous overhead uh, and, and large crews. You know, the, the, uh, the Ukrainians were very clever uh, in how they um, have uh, inflicted so much damage on the Russian Black Sea Fleet. They destroyed the headquarters in Sevastopol with two Storm Shadow missiles. And then with one storm shadow, after, after special forces were able to go in and knock out radar, they had, had one storm shadow destroyed the dry dock in Sevastopol. Without the dry dock, you can't do maintenance on your major ships. So the Russian Black Sea Fleet is having to reposition further to the east to Novorossiysk, which is not nearly as capable as Sevastopol from a geographic standpoint. So I think uh, Australia, obviously, given this geography, has to have... Um, adequate or um, it has to have the maritime capability necessary to protect all of its interests. Um, that's expensive. Having the right stuff is um, as important as having enough stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I agree with you there, Ben. And Ben, thank you very much for joining us again and for sharing your insights on the focus. Thanks for the privilege. Thank you. Former Commander, NATO Allied Land Command and International Commentator on Defence and Security, Ben Hodges. And to our audience, thanks for tuning into the Focus podcast. We hope that you found today's discussion enlightening and thought-provoking. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to reach out to us on social media. You can find the Focus on Facebook, referenced on the John Bruni and Sage International LinkedIn pages, and on Twitter, or on the Sage International website, sageinternational.com.au, by clicking the Media Center drop-down menu and hitting Podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, and or leave us a review on your favorite platform. My thanks to our stalwart production team of Malcolm Hughes and Neil Smart and to the team at the Ozcast Network. We hope that you'll join us again as we continue to delve into the most pressing current affairs issues of our time. Until then, stay informed and stay engaged. I'm John Bruni, and from Adelaide, South Australia, you've been listening to The Focus. Mm -hmm.